Um, Francisca, can you give me a verification that people can see my screen or you can see my screen? Yes, everything looks perfect on my end. Great. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about PyGMT. Um, and before introducing PyGMT, uh, I just wanted to show a map because that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, this is a map of the cities that folks uh, provided to the Google form I posted in the announcements channel. So if you haven't filled that out yet and you do feel comfortable, um, pl please do uh, put that information in there. It will be good uh, not only for making fun visualizations such as this, but um, it'll also help us analyze how we performed and, and li quite literally help us understand our geographic reach. Um, so I think it's just interesting to take a look at, at a couple of different ways to, to visualize the locations of Rosa's students. Um, and of course, these maps were made in PyGMT. And uh, if you're interested in learning how to, to produce um, some of these, uh, that'll be our bonus exercise, our homework. Uh, I posted this outline in the Slack as well, but if you didn't see it, I plan to talk for 15 to 20 minutes with some slides about GMT, about PyGMT, and about Python mapping in general. And then we'll transition to uh, going through a Jupyter Notebook together. That will be a tutorial uh, for PyGMT use, the basic stuff. Uh, and then we'll take a break and I'll probably drink some more coffee. And when we return, uh, we will, I will introduce a, a lab notebook um, that will have some more real world applications of PyGMT. So some more practical use cases that you might, you might find yourself using PyGMT for in the wild. And that's our, that's our outline. I wanted to share the, uh, the results of this poll that I posted in, in, in the, uh, the PyGMT Slack channel. This isn't totally up to date, uh, but I think it's interesting to see what folks' um, previous experience with some of these tools are. Um, and also to note that um, PyGMT, which is the snake, and Cardopy, which is this map emoji, um, are used uh, far less than um, plain old GMT, and it, it speaks to uh, how young these packages are. Um, so it's an interesting time to, to be uh, making maps with Python. So about PyGMT. PyGMT, you can think of two ways, and it's helpful to think about it in these two ways. Uh, one, the first way is PyGMT is a Python package for making maps and, and plotting. Uh, you can install it via Conda, uh, and you can use it to produce figures um, that show geographic uh, or Cartesian information. Um, another way to think about it, though, is if you're used to GMT, PyGMT is a wrapper around GMT. It is powered by GMT, um, and it uses GMT to make figures in a way that is a little bit more uh, useful or, or uh, familiar to folks that use Python. And so what is GMT? GMT stands for the Generic Mapping Tools, and they are some command line tools, usually accessed from the terminal or um, the standard use case is by building shell scripts. And so by wrapping GMT with Python, uh, we one, make it a little easier to use, and two, we allow for easy um, IO, input and output of usual Python objects. So PyGMT is essentially GMT combined with Python. And in order to understand PyGMT, I want to spend a few slides talking about the generic mapping tools. Here I've just copied a, a relevant quote from the GMT uh, web page. Um, basically, these, these are command line tools. They work with geographic data, so maps, as well as Cartesian data, so XYZ stuff. 
um, they allow you to manipulate data as well as the primary function, which is producing high quality illustrations. And I, I've emphasized that in bold just because um, GMT is very excellent at producing um, publication quality figures. Um, and GMT has been around for a long time. So uh, the first version, version one, was released uh, more than three decades ago. Uh, and now we're on version six. And so a lot, it's come a long way. Um, but it is, a, it is a very mature uh, software package. And because it's mature and because it's quite popular in, in the geosciences and the seismology community in particular, you've probably seen a lot of GMT figures. Um, from paper figures uh, to AGU presentations, um, GMT figures are everywhere. However, you may not have made too many GMT figures. And perhaps you have, and that's great, but if you haven't, that's also great. Um, and one of the reasons why you might have not is that the learning curve can be quite steep. Um, it's maybe more of a, of a learning cliff than a learning curve, in fact. Um, and here are just a couple commands that I've copy pasted from the GMT example gallery. Um, just these long strings and slashes and pluses and you don't really know what's going on and the GMT confused module does not actually exist, but it's a metaphor for how I felt in the past uh, using GMT. So one of the goals of PyGMT is to uh, reduce this learning curve uh, and make GMT a little more accessible uh, to new users while still retaining all of the functionality of GMT. Um, because even though it's frustrating to use, uh, the output is very satisfying when you obtain this, this beautiful map. And speaking of beautiful maps, I did want to highlight a few examples of what GMT can do. Um, at far left is an example folks might be familiar with. This is a USGS shake map uh, showing um, ground um, shaking intensity. And this is produced with GMT. In the middle, we have a very nice figure by Aaron Weck um, showcasing all of the sort of detailed map elements that GMT is capable of plotting. Scale bars, insets. Um, in this case, we've got uh, plate boundaries and um, contour lines for slabs um, and all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, this looks like uh, someone produced it in ArcGIS, but in fact, it's produced with a free program uh, and it's also made programmatically. And those are two, two important factors. Uh, at upper right, this is just an example from the uh, GMT gallery, just demonstrating the three-dimensional plotting capability. Um, and at bottom right, uh, this is a slope angle map. Uh, so it's a, a topographical map where, where angle is highlighted, produced entirely in GMT. So a very nice example. So these are just a couple of examples of what GMT can, can do. I want to briefly talk about the anatomy of a GMT figure, uh, because this will help us when we move to PyGMT in learning how PyGMT is thinking and how it puts, uh, how it composes a figure. So this is uh, a nice uh, figure of topography and bathymetry of, of Hawaii. Um, and this is the shell script that I use to produce this figure. And there's some supporting uh, variables that I've set up at the top and I've done some conversion at the bottom, but really I want us to focus on these five lines. And even if you're not familiar with GMT, you might be able to see or guess what each of these lines is doing in terms of the figure construction. So the first line is producing this base map. That's actually the, the, the frame uh, with the alternating black and white stripes and, and the annotations with the lat latitude and longitude. The grid image command with this earth relief is giving you the bathymetry and topography and shading that. That's the second command. Then we've got the coast that's plotting these black outlines around the islands. Uh, and then the fourth and the fifth lines here plot the location of Kilauea volcano as that red triangle and label it respectively. And so each of these lines is doing something to the figure. 
Um, and the interesting thing about how GMT works and also how PyGMT works is that GMT in the background is constructing of what we call a postscript file. So if you've ever seen a file with a .ps extension, that stands for postscript. And postscript is actually a language. Um, it's a language used to describe how to, how to draw something. Um, and so when you are, each of these, each of these lines um, with these arrows is actually first creating this, this script and then appending text to it. Um, and that's what the double right arrow is indicating here. So if you've ever used G GMT before and you've had to keep track of your O's and your K's and all of that, that's because each line of this script is actually just outputting text. You're just directing that text to be added to a file. Um, and this is a file that you could open up and read. You could go to your terminal and you could cat this file and you could actually read it. It would be very long and it would be very boring and I would not recommend it even in quarantine. However, it's important to understand that each of these commands is happening after the next one and just adding to the bottom of the file. So there's a sense of stacking of layers. Um, and the best way I can demonstrate this is by taking the same figure and I've actually put it, I just realized I'm not sharing my correct screen. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna share my entire desktop. Share, okay. Can folks see the, or Francisca, can you see the PowerPoint here? Yeah. Great. So the best way I could think of to demonstrate this layers thing is actually by using this feature in, in PowerPoint. So here is what's going on with this GMT figure. Um, I showed these five commands, the, the base map, grid image, the coast, the, the uh, PSXY, and then the PS text. So these five commands, and they're actually in order. So you're stacking up this file and then the code to produce this is occurring at the end. So unlike in matplotlib where you might be able to adjust the, the Z order if you're familiar with that, if you make this call down here and uh, label this prematurely, it's going to be hidden. And so the order of your calls with GMT and this translates to PyGMT matters. So whenever you're using GMT and whenever you're using uh, PyGMT, just try to keep in mind that the order in which you call stuff matters. So if you put this coast command after your text, uh, it's going to be overlapping there. So just something to keep in mind that will help you uh, when you transition to composing stuff with PyGMT. Now to switch gears a little bit, uh, I wanted to discuss other Python mapping options. And it's really easy to talk about them because there are two options, PyGMT, which I'll be talking about today, and also Cartapy, which is another Python package. So I put together this little table to uh, outline the differences and similarities between these two tools. Um, just a disclaimer, I use both of these tools. I may be more, uh, I have more of a developer role with PyGMT, but I use both of these tools and I think both have their, their pluses and minuses depending on the application. And I think that most folks uh, would find the same. The first thing I wanna highlight with these two packages is their current release numbers. Um, with software development, we have this versioning system called semantic versioning. And without getting into the details, uh, the main thing to know is that this first number here, which is the, let me see if I can use my mouse. Can I use my mouse spotlight? Is that what I want? No, maybe I just want my mouse. Oh, well, anyways, uh, the first, this number here and the leading number for the version is a zero for both of these packages. And what this means is that either of these packages can make what we call breaking changes. So they can make dramatic changes to their code um, until they get to that version one. Um, this is equivalent to if OBSPY uh, tomorrow decided that instead of uh, calling the stream filtering method stream.filter, uh, if they called it stream.filter underscore kittens. That wouldn't make much sense, one, 
But more importantly, it would break a bunch of people's code really, really fast. Um, and so that's what can happen here. And that's one of the downsides of using either of these packages. However, one of the bonuses of this is that um, development is occurring very rapidly. And so what this means um, is that features are getting added very quickly. So Carta Pi might not support a scale bar right now, but you might be able to add a scale bar to a map in, in four months of time. Um, so development is very quick. So that's one of the bonuses. Um, the second factor here is the plotting backend. So I've mentioned before that PyGMT uses GMT. Um, so it is constructing a PostScript file that you can then convert to PDF or PNG or any other format you require. Cartapy is actually based on matplotlib. And so it inherits all of the sort of interactive functionality uh, that matplotlib has and the plotting commands carry over very nicely. So if you're used to matplotlib, you'll be used to Cartapy. This relates to this third row, which is the interactive point. Uh, with PyGMT, you don't have that option, just simply because you're building a static uh, PostScript file. With Cartapy, uh, panning and zooming and whatnot is supported because it's supported with, with the matplotlib interactive backends. Uh, both of these packages uh, are installable via Conda. Um, you can forget the days where installing GMT was a pain. Um, Maybe I'll eat my words here, but it seems like most folks have been able to install the environment okay. Um, you can now install GMT and therefore PyGMT via Conda. Cardapy is also very easy. So installation should be very easy. The next factor is mapping features. And this is where there's a large difference between PyGMT and Cardapy. And it's related to their backends. So Cardapy is based upon matplotlib, which gives it that interactive functionality but matplotlib was not initially designed to make maps. And so Cartapy has to implement a lot of mapping features on top of matplotlib. Um, and all of that is possible. The framework is there. However, uh, it, is, it, it takes time to add these features. Um, on the flip side, GMT, PyGMT is based upon GMT, which has been around for uh, several decades and is very mature and has developed a lot of very nice features for plotting a map elements, for example. So PyGMT's feature set is actually quite extensive. I put a star there though, however, because PyGMT still needs to wrap those GMT uh, modules. So those GMT map element plotting uh, commands. And so I'll show a little bit later how you can use any sort of GMT feature uh, in PyGMT, but sometimes you need to add a little, a little bit more code to access that feature if it hasn't been wrapped by PyGMT. But in terms of development, it's a little easier uh, to implement those features of GMT. We just make the Python translation for them. The next row is, is about projections. Both of these have an exceedingly large number of geographic projections, probably more than anyone would uh, need to use for most applications. So that's really great. The final thing is grid operations. And what I mean by grid operations is uh, processing of uh, files such as GeoTIFFs or NetCDF files. So say you have a, a digital elevation model uh, that you would like to uh, reproject because you're plotting it near the poles, um, or you have a tomographic uh, model and you're going to take a depth slice through it uh, and you'd like to resample it. Um, PyGMT will generally be faster than Cartapy with these sorts of operations. And the reason why is that PyGMT, again, is based on GMT and GMT is written in C, which is a very fast language, and it uses a very fast C library as well for processing grids. Cartapy um, leverages a, a number of resampling and other algorithms, but they're not necessarily going to be as fast. Um, so you can accomplish both tasks, but um, certainly anecdotally, and I think that if you actually did some comparisons, you'd see that, that PyGMT can be quite faster, especially for large grids. So that's something to keep in mind between these two tools. However, um, I just want to re-emphasize re that I think both have their place, 
uh, depending on how you're um, and what you're trying to accomplish. If you are building uh, a open source software package that produces station maps that you want folks to be able to navigate around, then card apply might be better. But for your personal research and for producing uh, publication quality illustrations uh, with more mapping details, then PyGMT uh, might be a little bit more appropriate. Um, and that actually concludes uh, my little slideshow here. Um, you'll notice I didn't talk at all about PyGMT syntax, and that's because we'll be covering it extensively uh, over the next 40 or so minutes um, with the lecture notebook. And so I just put up this little reminder here. Uh, you'll want to change directories to wherever you downloaded those two files. Uh, if you haven't gotten them yet, they're on the uh, PyGMT Slack channel. You'll definitely want to make sure you activate your Roses environment. And then you can just type Jupyter Notebook, which will launch, launch a notebook in your downloads or whatever folder showing those two showing those two files. And now um, we will go ahead and launch those, that notebook, the lecture notebook. So I will demonstrate that. So here I have my two notebooks, lecture and lab, as well as some solutions, which you guys don't get to see. And I need to activate my roses environment. And now we will launch the Jupyter Notebook. So I'll give folks one minute to do this. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to increase my font size because it seems like that's been a common theme, common request. Can someone, can Francisca, since I know you're online, can you please let me know if how that size looks or do I, should I increment it? Uh, one I would go a little bit bigger. Maybe one more. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Excellent. So I think we're going to go ahead and start working through this notebook. Um, so again, make sure that your roses environment is activated because we're about to import PyGMT. And so if it's not activated, you'll find out very soon. So starting off, I mentioned that PyGMT is a Python package. And so we can import it just like any other Python package. We have, we have a quick question. Um, sure. Is PyGMT built specifically for GMT6 or will it work with earlier versions? It is built specifically for GMT6. It will not work with versions less than GMT6. Uh, and the reason why it will not work for versions less than GMT6 uh, is that in GMT6, um, there was a big change to how uh, the, uh, essentially how the mode of, of, of building a PostScript file works. Um, so the, the shell script that I, sh that I showed uh, to make that uh, figure of Hawaii is actually an older style GMT shell script. It's, it's, a, it's a GMT5 shell script in the sense that you have to make this PostScript file, you have to append to it and all that. Um, in GMT6, they introduced a really nice method called modern mode, uh, which allows you to sort of hide the PostScript uh, creation part and just focus on the commands. And that is something that PyGMT relies upon. Um, so PyGMT requires at least GMT6. Um, and if you install it with Conda, um, it will actually force that installation. Um, so the good thing about GMT6 is that it's backwards compatible with GMT5. So it's been designed such that these the previous scripts, such as that shell script I showed, still run 
in GMT6. And in fact, I made that shell script using GMT6, um, using what they call the classic mode. So yes, the answer is PyGMT requires GMT6 uh, at minimum. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so we've imported PyGMT. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is create a figure object. Um, and throughout this, this lecture, I'm going to try to draw parallels between PyGMT and, and matplotlib, assuming a little bit more, more folks are familiar with matplotlib syntax. So this is very equivalent to saying fig equals plt.figure. So we'll create this PyGMT figure. And then the question is, what do we want to do next? And in PyGMT, almost everything you do to, to uh, add elements to a figure um, is accomplished through methods of the figure class, meaning figure dot whatever you want to do. Um, and I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce the PyGMT website, which is at pygmt.org. Um, we have, you know, there's actually a lot going on here, but I want to just jump right to this section called API reference, which stands for application programming interface, but you don't have to remember that. All you have to remember is that these are all these plotting methods. And so if you're wondering what you want to do, uh, go into this API reference, uh, which I've linked from the notebook, will tell you a few commands. So we see figure.coast, plot continents, shorelines, and rivers. That seems like a reasonable thing to do for our first map. So we'll go ahead. And here's the call to uh, add coastlines. And if you use GMT, this would be PS coast. Um, we specify a region and a projection, which I will get into in more detail. Um, and then there's these other keyword arguments. So variable equals whatever. Um, I'm saying we want to plot shorelines. I'm saying we want to color the water light blue, color the land gray, and give the map a frame. And these are fairly self-explanatory, but if you want to go into more detail about their options, you can go to this uh, API reference uh, linked page and learn about them. And so we'll run this command and then realize that nothing happened. And the reason why nothing happened is that PyGMT requires you to explicitly show the figure at the end. It's like running matplotlib in um, non-interactive mode where you need that call to plt.show or fig.show to show the figure. So we'll go ahead and run this. And hooray, we have our first PyGMT map. You can see how we have the light blue water and the, the gray land and our shorelines with our frame. Um, that's one option for showing the figure that works in the notebook. However, if you're, if you're using um, just the IPython console or an IDE or something else or a script, you'll want to use method equals externals. This, key, this option to the show command will actually show the figure uh, in your external PDF viewer, which on Mac OS, which is my platform, is preview um, and will be the equivalent on, on your Unix or Linux system. And so you can see here that we can actually zoom in and it's, it's, a, it's a PDF and it's automatically been cropped and you can see that our resolution of our coastlines looks poor as you zoom in. So this will automatically produce a cropped PDF uh, for you that you can then save um, and use in your presentations or publications. So I wanna go back and talk about two important keyword arguments, the region and the projection. Um, they are, they appear in almost every command. And in fact, they're required at the beginning of your figure creation so that PyGMT knows uh, what shape of map you want to produce and also uh, what your extent is going to be. So the region argument um, controls the extent of the figure. And in GMT, you would use dash R and then have um, your minimum and maximum X and minimum and maximum Y. Uh, separated by slashes, but here we just use a list. So regions are specified as these lists of x min, x max, y min, y max, such as this. Um, however, there's additional really cool functionality um, that allows GMT to pick out extents corresponding to um, political boundaries. And so instead of pr providing uh, a list, of, of the extent, you can actually give 
uh, a string corresponding to an ISO code, which is a standardized two-letter code for each country. And if you give it that code, it'll give you the extent corresponding to that country. So EG would, would give you the region for Egypt. Um, and even in the US, you can actually parse it down to state. Um, so you can say US dot and then the state uh, two-letter code, which is pretty nice. Um, and finally, there's another shortcut called G, and that just gives you a global domain. And so if you'll notice up top, at the very beginning, I said, hey, I want to plot the entire globe. Here's region equals G. The second very important argument is the projection argument. In GMT, this is dash J. Um, and the way that GMT handles projections is with these codes. So projections have a one letter code, uh, and then you follow that with any sort of additional parameters you might need to describe the projection, such as the central longitude and or latitude. And then you finish that with either a map scale or a width of your projection. Um, so there are a ton of projections available. Um, and you can go from anywhere from these basic Cartesian XY to very boutique exotic projections. Um, so here's an example of, of how this translates. Um, JM4I in GMT parlance means a Mercator projection of width four inches. Uh, the equivalent pi GMT argument is projection equals M4I because we don't need the flag part. We're just saying, hey, the projection is equal to this letter and these parameters. And so I've written the form here, which you can read in more detail. And uh, here's a more complicated example here. Um, S stands for, or, or indicates that we want a stere general stereographic projection. And in this case, we actually need to provide some additional arguments for the central longitude and the central latitude of that projection, as well as the width. And so this stands for a six inch wide general stereographic projection centered on longitude minus 150, latitude 90. Um, and if you want to know about what projection you want to use, I've linked this list, which show is, is kind of gathers all of the available projection codes. And so these are the full codes. So again, you just need this, the C, and then it tells you, hey, these are the, the, the parameters you need to, to provide. And so I went down here and I said that I wanted a general stereographic projection. That's JS and I gave it these parameters. But this is where you can go uh, to look up for a given projection uh, what you need to provide. Um, so I want to show the effect of changing the region here. Uh, here's a basic map of the US uh, Pacific Northwest, and we've specified the region with um, these lat long arguments. And this is a, uh, a Mercator projection of, of width four inches. But I'm going to switch this up entirely, and we're going to go to Japan, which has the ISO country code of JP. So I've plotted now, and we automatically crap. Uh, crop to the region of Japan. Um, we can do this for New Zealand. Get this nice map of New Zealand. Um, and then I'll demonstrate as well with US states. I'm guessing here, I think Florida is FL. And so we crop to Florida. Um, and so this is a nice, a, a convenient way um, to quickly get the right context uh, for your map without having to look up the appropriate um, dimensions. And again, I'll just demonstrate here um, how we would change these. So if we want to go down to a 40 degree minimum latitude, we've started to get down here into um, Northern California. And that's how the region argument works. The next thing we should play around with is projection. So in this map, it's, I've used the same code as above. The only thing I have changed is the projection. And now we can translate this. I want a general stereographic projection. I want the central longitude to be 
minus 125, which is in the center of this map, which is intentional. And I want the uh, central latitude or the reference point to be at the North Pole. And it should be four inches wide. So when you plot this, you get this type of map. And you'll notice it's centered on minus 125. And then if you were to imagine projecting these two uh, spines up, they would meet at the North Pole. So that, that's what it means to have that reference point there. Um, so I can demonstrate a little bit more explicitly this by going to 90 degrees here on the region. And this looks pretty hilarious, um, but this is what actually what it looks like. We're taking a slice of the globe all the way to 90 degrees. And so you'll notice that Pi GMT doesn't prevent you from doing anything like this. I mean, this would be a very odd figure and might require a new paper size convention uh, for manuscripts, um, but it is possible to do this. Um, I'll also demonstrate uh, changing the uh, central longitude of the projection. So we're at minus 125 now, if I go to minus 130. This should make sense, right? Now we have our central uh, longitude and minus 130, and you can actually push it further uh, to accomplish some pretty silly things as well. So now, tracing this down, we're at minus 142. Um, so that's an example of how you can manipulate uh, the projections. Um, I'll also demonstrate quickly changing the width. If we make this a six inch wide figure, it's shown as the same size within, uh, within the notebook, but if you were to open this to PDF, it would now be larger. And so in this, in this way, you can sort of specify, hey, I want a, a single column figure or a two column figure. You can specify that in um, whichever units uh, you might uh, prefer. And so 10 centimeters, for example. So that's a little bit about the projection. Um, and I want to show a little bit about distortion of projections, but I am not a cartographer. It's a full disclaimer. Um, so uh, if you're looking for specific questions about, well, how do you, you know, represent area equally or direction um, accurately or all this, um, Wikipedia is going to be your, your best friend there because I, I can't help you. But I do want to show the effect of um, distortion near the poles. Um, and I'm going to do this by uh, totally manipulating um, Alaska. So with Alaska, um, you know, I, again, I can extend um, this up to almost the North Pole. And we see we have a nice cone shape here and this makes sense. Um, but what if I decide to make this a Mercator projection instead of a stereographic one? Might have to wait a little bit. And this sort of, I hope demonstrates why we don't use Mercator projections uh, near the poles, because they have a hard time dealing with, with uh, those lines of uh, latitude converging, or longitude converging, sorry. So that's an example of, of, of the fact that GMT does not actually uh, change your, uh, or, or modify your projection. It lets you do whatever you want. So now I want to get into some of the plotting commands. Again, these are all available through that API reference that I mentioned. Uh, the first is figure.plot. Um, it's a pretty self-explanatory command. This is where you go if you want to make other plot lines or symbols on maps. And the big uh, command here to be aware of, so I've, I've first set some variables, point fill and, and number of points, and I've generated some random integer data in the region of Alaska. And then we're going to call this fig.plot command. And because I haven't made a new figure, we're going to use the one we already made up here. So we're going to take this figure and we're going to continue adding layers to it. Um, we're adding to that postscript, if you recall. So I've made some points. We give it the x and the y. Uh, the style argument um, tells GMT both the symbol size or both the symbol style and the size. And so in this case, A means star and 0.2 inches gives the diameter of that symbol. And I've linked uh, to the documentation for these as well. So it's the same thing where 
you know, the dash s flag, we translate that to style equals whatever. Um, and so then I've given it a fill color and pen is the outline. And if we plot this, we have our points. I can change the color here and I can change the symbol size to squares and let's make them slightly smaller. That's not gonna work. Zero point, ugh, 0 0.15, there it is. Hey Liam, we have two questions. Sure. So the first question is, can we control the tick, tick label placement and spacing? Yes, uh, you can. Uh, the way you control that is through a parameter I didn't talk about, and I apologize. That parameter is frame. And frame equals true. In fact, I think I could just demonstrate it here. Frame equals true will plot your frame and also plot annotations, and it's sort of the default um, basic option that you'd want. In this case, I used frame equals zero, which actually uh, just gives the outline. Um, but you can control this more finely um, with annotation and fine spacing. So annotation spacing is given by this A and then whatever you uh, follow that with. So say five will be five degree spacing. And then one would be uh, one uh, degree just for the ticking. So this is pretty ugly, but you can see that we have A major annotation is five and then minor is one. Um, and you can, you can actually parse that out for both axes. Um, this is something that you can look up on the GMT documentation. Um, and I apologize for not covering it here, um, but it's definitely possible and that's how you accomplish it. And I'll add a few more points here. Um, you've noticed I've also added this label keyword argument uh, to the plotting command. This is similar to matplotlib, where you can label your points. And then uh, I've labeled them with the color of the point. And then um, they've plotted nicely. And then you can actually add this single command called figure.legend, which will read through all of your commands that used label and make a legend for them. So in this case, we have a legend and the label was just the color. If you recall from up here, label is point fill. So that's how a basic legend is achieved. Um, the second major command I want to introduce is grid image. Um, grid image is similar to IM show for matplotlib and it's used for plotting DEMs, um, tomographic slices, any sort of gridded data, meaning X, Y, and pixel value on a map. And GMT is really great for this because it allows you to automatically download and use um, some data sets that it stores on a server. And so with grid image, you can provide an actual file name on your local machine, or you can browse through some of their available data sets, which I've linked to here. And by specifying a string starting with at, uh, GMT will actually grab that data set down and plot it for you. And so that's what we're gonna do here. Um, in this case, I've made my figure, I've done grid image and keyword arguments is just a shortcut for populate it with whatever is in this dictionary. Um, so these two stars unpack, that's what we call it unpacking and are the qu equivalent to supplying all of these keyword arguments. So I gave it the grid, global, the projection, and then a, a frame here. And I've also shifted our figure origin and plotted again. Um, this time with an additional parameter called shading equals true, which adds illumination to the surface. And so a grid image has a, this shading keyword argument that's really great for highlighting um, your DEMs or gravity data, et cetera. And so I've plotted, um, the figure on the left is without shading, and then I've shifted our origin three inches, which tells PyGMT, wherever you're plotting, plot three inches to the right. And then uh, we've done shading here. So hopefully um, on your machines, this will probably download this, this will download this file. Um, 
and then hopefully you can see the difference uh, between the two, um, the two images here. And the data sets that you can use, I've linked to as well. Um, this is tiny font, I apologize. Um, so this is the site you can go to and you access them like this. There's a little key and you can see, okay, depending on how much resolution you want, you can go all the way up to uh, one arc second, uh, which is about 30 meters, I believe. Um, so it's a very useful command for instantly adding geographic context to your uh, station maps or, or otherwise. Um, the other use for grid image that I think is really important if you're coming from GMT is that you don't need to provide a file name. You can actually provide a Python object to grid image and it will plot that object like it was a file. And the object that uh, PyGMT uses for this is called an X-Array data array. Um, and there could be a whole class on this package called X-Array, but in two sentences, if you've used pandas, X-Array is three-dimensional pandas. If you haven't used pandas, X-Array is a way to store three-dimensional data sets with labeled coordinates. So you can give it uh, your latitude, longitude, and depth, and it's populated with values um, for a tomographic model, for example. Uh, would be one way to store an object uh, as a data array. But I've linked to the documentation there, and we have some examples, including the one here. Um, in this case, I've imported xarray and numpy, and I've made this function. And this is a, um, a function of two variables. It's just a function that returns, um, will return a grid. So you, x and y can be grids, and it'll return a, a two-dimensional grid of values um, for this function, which is called the Ackley function. Um, and you'll see what it looks like when we plot it. And I make an increment. I make my x vector, my y vector. I make a grid out of those, and I feed that to my function. And this will this is returned. What's returned here is a, um, is a is a matrix of essentially height values, our z coordinate. And I also tell X-ray that I want the coordinates to be x and y, so it knows that the dimensions and the range how they range. And so I make this data array, and then I'm going to plot it with grid image, giving it the data instead of a file. I do want to plot the frame. I give it a color map this time. And x is going to say, we just want a normal x, y coordinate system. And so when you plot this, we've automatically chosen the axis limits correctly. And uh, what's shown here is the uh, function value. Um, for this Ackley function. So it's actually a really spiky. Um, the other uh, the cool thing about PyGMT is depending on how you choose your projection, um, PyGMT will interpret those coordinates uh, as geographic coordinates. So right now we have an array that ranges from minus 20 to 20 and it's got values. Um, and we plotted it uh, just on a Cartesian coordinate system. But if we plot it on a map, uh, GMT knows that these coordinates correspond to lo uh, longitude and latitude. So this is how you actually um, would plot, say, your, your shear wave velocity depth slice on your map. Um, so here, it's the same thing. I make some coastlines just to give some context. And I plot the data. I use a different color map. And this flag here is saying, if a value is NAN, make it transparent. Um, I've additionally added another feature called a color bar, uh, or this, this method plots a color bar, and it is called fig.colorbar. And this will plot a color bar with the function values um, taken from your, from your input data with the color map given. So here is the same, uh, this is the same function. You can see that zero, um, the meridian comes down like this, and it's, it's centered on zero, zero. And it goes to, you know, this is 15 degrees here, so it goes to 20 and minus 20. But since we've given it to this map, we're plotting it in a geographic uh, space. Um, and this is the number of kittens. So it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very powerful feature that you can now use your Python objects, you know, coming from your, your uh, <clears throat> tomographic models, et cetera, directly um, in PyGMT. 
Um, and now we're at 11 o'clock my time. I'm just going to show one more feature of PyGMT to round out this tutorial. Uh, and that is how to access GMT modules of PyGMT. This is a very important feature of PyGMT if you already are a GMT user or power user, uh, because the one thing you might encounter is, well, I've made this nice PyGMT map, I have my coastlines, I've got my uh, bathymetry that I'll plot it all nicely, and man, I really want to plot a focal mechanism. But I went to the API reference page of PyGMT, and I noticed that there was no uh, figure.mecha method. Well, um, the good news is that any, any module that GMT has, PyGMT can access um, through a special function called the C library uh, <coughs> module. I should say it's a special module. Um, so this is more of an advanced cell, but I wanted to put it here uh, because it's really important to know that you don't need to give up on PyGMT because you can't access a certain, a certain module. So uh, this is a session. This is the session class. And what it allows you to do is it opens up a portal to GMT. So using your existing figure and all that, it allows you to quickly jump in and call any module you want. And that module's commands will get applied to the PyGMT's, uh, the existing PyGMT figure. And here's an example using Mecha, uh, which, which plots focal mechanisms. Um, so we start as usual, we make a figure. Um, this, is, uh, this region corresponds to India. Uh, we have a projection frame and all that. Borders equals one is gonna give us political boundaries. And now we need to call Mecha, but we can't call it using fig.mecha because it doesn't exist. So instead, we're gonna use this context. So, Mecha takes as input, if you've used it before in GMT, it takes as input a file, which has columns corresponding to moment tensor parameters. And so we need to be able to provide a file to Mecha. If Mecha were, were wrapped in PyGMT, uh, then you could just supply maybe an array to accomplish this. But because it's not wrapped yet, and I'll get to that, um, you have to provide a file. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a context manager, which is what this with does. I'm saying, um, let's open up this temporary file. And you don't need to remember this syntax. You can just copy paste it, because that's what I do all the time. You open up a temporary file. We're going to open up this file uh, for writing and write um, this line, which is the moment. These are the focal mechanism specifications. So this is our um, longitude, latitude, and depth. Uh, strike, dip, and rake, magnitude, and then these are optional uh, arguments that are just zero in this case. And then this is the key command here that you need to pay attention to. We're going to open up this session temporarily, and then we're going to use this method called session.callModule, and we're going to call any GMT module that's available usually. So anything you can use in the command line. So in this case, we're going to call Mecca, and we're going to give Mecca the rest of this. The second argument here is just the string that you give to the module. In this case, we'll give it our temporary file, and then we'll tell it, um, this is a command that says, hey, interpret uh, this moment tensor with the Aki and Richards convention um, with a certain size. Um, and so this will actually call uh, Mecca, and then we close the context manager. So that's gonna remove the temporary file. It's gonna close this portal to the GMT underworld and then we can show the figure. And what you can see is that we have, you know, our, our initial coastline call, and then we made this call to Mecca afterwards, uh, and it, it plotted as expected. And you can go in here and you can change, um, change the strike to just north, and, and it changes as you'd expect. And so this is a way where you can use any GMT module you want in PyGMT. And you can imagine if you had a bunch of these, I mean, this doesn't have to be a string. This can be an array that you write to a string. And that is how we um, essentially um, can use any sort of GMT module with PyGMT. So with that, um, I wanted to close by just pointing everyone to a few resources that are, that are really important for using PyGMT and GMT in general. If you're totally new to PyGMT, uh, or if you need to know how to do something in PyGMT, pygmt.org 
is where you want to go. Because not only does it have this nice API reference telling you what we've implemented, it also has installation instructions. It's got a nice tutorial on how to make your figure. It's got uh, a gallery demonstrating um, how to do stuff like three-dimensional plots in PyGMT. And then there's an additional user guide. For example, the question about frame and ticks um, is probably answered here. Yeah, I think it's answered here. Um, and there's also a nice projection list um, as well. So uh, definitely go there if you have questions about usage of PyGMT. Um, we also have the development version of the documentation. So this development version is actually based upon the master branch of our GitHub repository. So this is like the most up-to-date documentation. And the main reason I want to show this is actually to give a shout out to a Roses participant. Um, so Tyler Newton uh, helped implement or essentially single-handedly implemented uh, a wrapper for Mecca. So this is the master branch. This has not been released yet. You can't get it on Conda, but I just wanted to point out how rapidly our, our uh, we're, we're moving here. We now have, if you check API reference, fig.mecha. And so this is the new PyGMT wrapper. And there's even an example here in the gallery of using Mecca as it's wrapped. And so now, instead of doing all that fanfare I showed, um, you actually can provide a dictionary of your focal mechanism in a really nice readable format and just call fig.mecha. So this is what I mean that by um, us being in this early development stage is that stuff can get added really fast. And if you have any ideas or things on your wish list, now is the right time uh, to head over to GitHub and make those future requests, which I'll show in a moment. But thank you, Tyler, for, for your work on that. It's really awesome. Uh, yeah, so we also have this forum. This is a general generic mapping tools forum. Um, and there is a topic or category called Q&A. And so if you have looked at the documentation and you don't know it's, you can't figure it out from there, but you don't think it's a bug, and that's, that's important, uh, this is where you should go. Um, you know, people are asking, in fact, someone just posted, hey, PyGMT, PS Mecca. You know, I made this beautiful map. And then, so one of the developers is pointing them to, to, to this uh, edition. So this is a great way to get help. Um, and oftentimes, Paul Wessel, um, who's actually one of the uh, co-designers um, of GMT, who is, the Darth, who is the Darth Vader here on his icon, um, often he will actually be the one to respond. So you can get help right from the developers. Finally, um, if you think something isn't working right, please, please, please don't just get frustrated um, and hit your computer. Because it would be bad for you to hit your computer. You might damage your computer. And also, if you tell us, then maybe we can fix it. So this is our GitHub repository. Um, we have a bunch of information here, but if you go to the second tab, uh, issues, uh, you can open up an issue and you can make a bug report or you can make a feature request. And so please, if you either have an idea for something that you wanna add um, or if you have a bug report, uh, please um, go to GitHub with those. Um, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, so so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and with that, that's all I have for the lecture notebook. Um, if there are any questions right now, I'm happy to answer them while we have this one open. Uh, if not, I guess we can take a, a bit of a break. And when we come back, I'll introduce the lab notebook. <laughs>